Good morning, everybody. What a wonderful joy to be with people all over the country to learn Torah. I can think of very little of that energizing to go into Shabbat as learning Torah with this many people from around the country. Um, this week we uh, read Parsha Pinchas, um, which is an interesting potpourri Parsha, uh, including um, the, the most commonly visited parts of Parsha Pinchas or toward the end of the Parsha when we read of the sacrificial lineup for all the different holidays, Shabbat, Rosh Chodesh, and all the holidays. And those are the Torah readings, the Maftir Torah readings on various holidays and, you know, the Torah reading for every Rosh Chodesh. So we actually, many synagogues, if they have multiple Sifrei Torah, keep one Sefer Torah rolled to Pinchas because they'll have to read it so often every Rosh Chodesh on the holidays. Um, and I'm imagining that Julie, as a Soferet, has probably had to touch up some Pinchas um, parshas several times because they get worn out. Um, it also has the story um, of Benot Tzalafcha, the daughters of Tzalafcha, this one family, the you know, patriarchal system that had only daughters and not sons. And there's a really interesting legal case that goes in the daughter's favor and changes uh, inheritance law. Um, we are going to be focusing on um, a little tiny line earlier in the Parsha that could almost escape our attention. Setting the scene, we have recently, um, I mean, without even mentioning it, a couple of weeks ago, 40 years passed, or 38 years passed, um, a generation died after the Korach uh, rebellion debacle. Um, the uh, time passes, and by Parshat Chuka, the uh, events in Chuka two weeks ago, 40 years have passed. And a lot has happened, and now the Israelites are about to turn and go on their way. And before that, um, this week's Parsha does not a, does basically a new census and listing all the households of every tribe in order to take stock of who's still around. And over the course of that, we learned something very interesting from, uh, from a couple of weeks ago. Okay, one second, let me share screen. Okay, so we are calling this week's text study, but Korach's children did not die, collective punishment and spiritual creativity. So in chapter 26 of the book of Bemidbar, Numbers, in the midst of uh, this accounting of all the households of each tribe, we find out that within the tribe of Levi, the sons of Eliav were Nimuel, sorry, in the, within the tribe of Ruvain, the sons of Eliav were Nimuel and Datan and Abiram. And then the Torah gives a little aside, just to let us know who Datan and Aviram were, because they're dead by now. That is Datan and Aviram, the appointed people of the assembly, Kriye Haida, the Machers, who incited against Moshe and Aharon in Korach's assembly when they incited against Adonai. Whereupon the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them and Korach when that assembly died, when the fire consumed the 250 persons and they became a sign or a banner by you, Lenes. But the children of Korach did not die. Bene Korach lo metu. And that's a fascinating little detail that the Torah did not tell us at the time of the Korach um, episode. And we might be a little surprised to find it out now. So this week we're going to explore the backstory of B'nai Korach Lo Metu and the implications moving forward. Um, if you have thoughts about what it might imply, um, you can share in the chat as we go. So the plot thickens. What became of Korach's children? Well, I should back up and say that it's surprising information. I didn't put this text on the, on the sheet. Maybe I should have. But in the Korach story three weeks ago, the Torah says that Korach died in all of his households. 
And so it's surprising, and, and all of his household and all with him. And it's surprising then to find out that the children of Korach did not die. It certainly would seem that they're part of his household. How did they escape um, the fate? Once again, Korach uh, incited rebellion against Aharon's leadership um, and joined forces with Datan and Aviram, who were challenging Moshe's leadership into one big, uh, one big coup attempt, basically. And God struck them down very harshly. The earth opened up its mouth and swallowed them alive. And it sounded like um, Korach's entire household and all adjoined to him were punished and killed together. But the children of Korach did not die. Looking later on, let's look, jump way forward in future biblical history. In the book of Chronicles, when we're looking at whom King David appointed to different roles um, in the court. We are now many, 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 many generations later, well post Torah. And these are they whom David set over song in the house of Hashem after the, the ark had rest, uh, etc. So once David's doing the last things after he's uh, established a home for the ark, the ark had been homeless for a long time. He's established a home for it in a temporary house for Hashem. Only his son Shlomo will build the temple, but he set up a temporary um house for God with the, with the Holy Ark in it. And in order to do that, the last thing he has to assign all these different roles. So he assigns the, the musical leaders of the choir, the chief singers are from the Kahat branch of the tribe of Levi, Haman the singer, and let's look at Haman's entire um, lineage. Haman, was the son of Yoel, son of Shmuel, son of Elkanah, son of Yerucham, son of Eliel, son of Toach, son of Tzuf, son of Elkanah, son of Machat, son of Amasai, son of Elkanah, son of Yoel, son of Azariah, son of Tzfania, son of Tachat, son of Asir, son of Eviasaf, the son of Korach, the son of Yitzhar, son of Kahat, son of Levi, the son of Yisrael. So the person who becomes in charge of all song in the temple is a direct descendant of Korach. So it's not just that uh, Korach's children were spared the punishment of death, but at least one of them achieves um, great distinction in leading the whole Jewish people in how to offer praise to God. Three chapters after that, Book of Chronicles, chapter, Chronicles 1, chapter 9, we find out in Jerusalem dwells all the children of Judah and the children of Benjamin and the children of Ephraim and Manasseh and of the Levi'im. In other words, we're finding out where all the descendants of all the tribes are settling and what their jobs are. And Shalom, the son of Koray, the son of Eviasaf, the son of Korach and his brothers of his father's house, the Korachites, were over the work of the service keepers of the gates of the tent, and their fathers had been over the camp of Adonai, keepers of the entry. Pinchas, son of Alzar, was ruler over them in the past. And Matitiah, one of the Levi'im, who was the firstborn of Shalom, the Korachite, was entrusted with making the griddle cakes. Be'emunah al ma'aseh chavitim. So I want to just note that we have a person who led the most dangerous insurrection against the justly appointed leadership of the Jewish people, who was killed in a, by punishment in a fantastic, divine, miraculous punishment by God that was supposed to sweep up all who were with him and his whole household with him. And not only did his children somehow escape death, our Parsha didn't tell us how or why, whether they were righteous, whether they actually broke away from Korach, whether there's an accident, whether 
the earth swallowed them up and they managed to crawl out. We don't know. All our parsha tells us is that B'nai Korach lo metu, his children didn't die. And yet, later on, the direct descendants of this arch criminal become in charge of the whole spiritual regime of the Jewish people, instruction on how to sing to God, and also become in charge of security and the kitchen for the throne. Meaning the people who are entrusted with preventing insurrections and who have who are who are in position to poison the king if they wanted to are the people who are the direct descendants of somebody who led the insurrection. I mean, imagine finding out that some uh, generations down the line, the direct descendants of people who led the January 6th insurrection on Congress were now in charge of the security detail and food service of the United States Congress. Now, it's many generations removed. We have a lot of questions about what happened, but this should feel, us, feel very striking to us. There's a tremendous amount of vulnerability and trust in appointing somebody to cook or chief in charge of security. Think of the, uh, the rigorous security clearances that anybody who has any job associated with the FBI um, has to go through. And the people hired here as chiefs of the kitchen and of security and of spiritual worship are all direct descendants of Korach. I'm gonna pause for one second. I'll stop the chat, stop the share for a second and just open it up if people have, maybe for a few minutes, if people have thoughts. If you were the Midrash, you read this biblical record, which we have the following three facts. One, Korach and all of his household and all the people with him were killed in divine punishment. Two, B'nai Korach lo metu, the children of Korach did not die. Three, many, 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 many generations later, his direct descendants um, have the most spiritually elevated and national security elevated positions in the government. What do you make of that? What story would you tell? What backstory? How? If we need more information and we don't have more information, how do you imagine the field? What should we learn from this? Let's open it up. Let's maybe have uh, a few people, if you want to use the raise your hand uh, emoji, or if you want to type something in the chat, let's, um, let's collect some thoughts. Well, it explicitly, Emily C says, I'm wondering if Korach really died too. It very explicitly says that Korach died several times. Um, were the children old enough to have their own households? Jen asks, yeah, it doesn't say at the time. We don't know how old anybody was. Um, good question. Uh, other thoughts? How would you fill in? Steve says, just wondering when that point is that you no longer honor your father and mother as the sons of Korach must have done to see their father was wrong when Moses was right. I think there is something, I think there is something in Tehillim, Psalm 27 says, when my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will care for me. The sins of the fathers end after a certain number of generations. Um, maybe the children less than 20 years old were spared. So we have a few different responses implicit in um, trouble scrolling. Um, implicit in that first comment was the, I, I know I can't, I'm having trouble scrolling. My screen is being funny. Um, I can read the comments if you want. It was three comments up. The first one that I read out loud, I think the person's name is Paul, maybe, I'm not sure. I don't see Paul's, but Julia said um, perhaps. Oh, before, it, was before, it was before Julia. Before Julia. Or it was the first one I read out loud. I just can't scroll up right now. It was that double comment that ended with. Just wondering 
when that point is you no longer honor your father and mother. Oh, right. Okay. So the first, the, the first comment um, assumes that the children of Korach m must not have been killed because they broke off from Korach. They weren't part of the rebellion. They separated, whether that was all along they weren't with him or they separated it. And that's an interesting dynamic, given that the Torah commands us to honor our father and mother. But maybe they didn't honor their father and their, their father here, and that's what spared them. Maybe there are limits to honoring our father and mother when they, um, when they act sinfully. Psalm 27 does note that, um, I guess, it, when our parents are, are wicked, it's okay to step away from them because God will protect us. So maybe the, there's a backstory uh, there. That's one approach. Korach's direct descendants weren't part of his household because they had broken away. They had disowned their father. Um, that's one approach. Another approach, I mean, whoever it was, I think Julia who said that, uh, quoting the Godfather, a strange thing for the Torah, I mean, the, the point of the movie, The Godfather, it's, it's very odd how many people in the culture take the lessons of the Corleone family as lessons of leadership or something, because the movie is pretty clearly a dark portrayal of a failed collapsing family, but, but maybe, um, and uh, of the downfall of Michael Corleone morally, spiritually, but, um, um, but maybe there's some wisdom to, you know, to keeping your enemies closer that, that would ask more, that would raise more questions than it answers, because then why did the Torah, why did God kill the entire assembly very explicitly and very graphically? And if you want to keep your enemies closer, why not keep Korach and Zatan and Aviram and their whole band alive? Why not have Moshe bring them into the administration in some way? Um, um, Okay, I'm not, I thought the comments were very interesting when they came in. I can't read them right now. For some reason, I'm not able to scroll. Um, but I'm going to go back to sharing screen and we'll move on. Those are some really interesting um, potential directions to go in. Um, were they lucky or were they just and worthwhile and, uh, uh, and separated themselves from the household? Um, so let's I'll share my screen again. Um, can I find? Okay. So, moreover, the poetic record, we found out that Haman, a direct descendant of Korach, is in charge of song in the temple. We also see that 10 out of the 150 Psalms in the Book of Psalms are said to be written by the children of Korach. Start the way Psalm 42 begins. Lama Nasech, Mis Maskil, Livnei Korach. Livnei Korach, Maskil, Livnei Korach, Maskil, Shiri, Dido, etc. Ten different Psalms are authored by the children of Korach. We, we casually attribute the authorship of Psalms to David, but not all of them. And we have uh, these ten including a couple that are like major staples of our liturgy. Psalm 48 is the psalm we say as the daily psalm every Monday. Psalm 47 is the psalm that works us through the shofar service on Rosh Hashanah. So they, they, hit, they wrote some hits that are integral to, the leadership, to, to our worship. We regularly mention Korach's name in our liturgy in a positive context. As his descendants wrote some of these songs. So what do we make of all that? So I want to share with you some rabbinic musings um, to add on to our own musings about what must have happened. We see in a story in the Talmud Bavli, Masechet Sanhedrin, the children of Korach did not die. I want to like midrash that verse. It was taught in the name of our rabbi, that refers to when it says Rabbeinu, that refers to Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, the um, Rabbi Judah the Prince, the editor of the Mishnah. They said a place was fortified for them in Gehinom, 
and they sat upon it and sang songs. Well, let's see if we can understand kind of the geography of what's happening here. So this makes it sound like if the children of Korach did not die, and on that, it was taught that there was a special place fortified for them in Gehinom. It sounds like they were part, according to Rabbeinu, they were part of the assembly. The earth opens and swallows them. But somehow, they lucked out or merited to have a special fortified place in Gehinom. And they sat upon it and sang songs. Let's see if we can unpack that story a little bit. We're going to come back to the second part of this Gemara in a moment. Um, but I want to look at something else. So the Midrash, there's a Midrash collection called Midrash Tehillim. It's a work that goes through the Book of Psalms, not all 150 of them, but goes through the Book of Psalms, collecting um, and unpacking Midrashim verse by verse. In the very first, in, the, in a Midrash on the very first Psalm, we find a whole extended Midrash meditation on Korach and his children. What's interesting to me about that is that Psalm 1 is not one of the B'nai Korach Psalms, which implies to me that the, the author of this Midrash sees the fact of Korachite authorship of some of the Psalms as a major or maybe even the major theme of the book of Psalms. The very fact of their authorship should be seen as the major theme of the existence of the book of Psalms. How does this happen? So here is how this Midrash reads Psalm 1, which is not a Korachite Psalm, as being a poem about the Korach episode. The psalm opens, Happy is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. This refers to the sons of Korach, who did not walk in the counsel of their father. As is said, turn away please from the tents of these wicked men. In other words, before the punishment, God, Moshe, gave them an opportunity to turn away. Doesn't say that anybody did, but the Midrash is telling us, we learn from this, at that moment, the children broke away. The, the psalm continues, and in the ways of sin does not stand, as it said, the fire pans of the sinner, so they didn't go along with uh, their father, etc. In the dwelling of clowns does not dwell, Moshav Leitzim, Moshav, this refers to Korach, who would lampoon Moshe and Aaron, and then give some examples of uh, some of the lampooning. Um, Rather, in Hashem's Torah is his delight. So these are his sons who sang songs and said, huh, we're obligated in our father's honor, but could we contest Moshe, our teacher? The Midrash imagines them in the moment we, we recreated in the psalm, in the, in the chat a few minutes ago, of a dilemma that Korach's children were feeling. On the one hand, not supporting what their father is doing, but knowing that they have a biblical obligation to honor him. But that same Torah that gives that obligation of honoring your father was also brought to them by Moshe and Aharon. And it doesn't even, it doesn't make sense. How, how can you observe Torah by upending the leadership of the person who brought you Torah. Can we contest Moshe, our teacher? There's a fundamental conflict. They resolved that by standing and aligning themselves for Moshe's honor. They resolved it by uh, dividing away from Korach at that time. So such a person who, who avoids the, uh, the wicked is like a tree planted beside streams of water. These were the sons of Korach. When Korach and his gang were swallowed up, his sons found themselves like the mast of a ship, as it says, and they were a banner. And remember in our Parsha, right before it says, B'nai Korach lo metu, children of Korach didn't die, it says, with, it says that they became um, a sign. Now let's look back at that verse 
for a second, scrolling back. Um, so in context, where it says, uh, the sons of Eliyahu, Datan and Aviram, Korach's assembly, when the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them, and Korach, when that assembly died, when the fire consumed the 250 persons, and they became a sign. But the children of Korach did not die. The way the Masoretic text breaks up the verses, they became a sign, refers to all the people who died. They died as a sign, as a model for the rest of the people to know consequences of evil actions. The Midrash is breaking up the verse differently and saying, whereupon the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them in Korach when that assembly died, when the fire consumed the 250 persons, period. And, and in becoming, and when they became a sign, when they, literally a banner, when they became a masthead, the children of Korach did not die. So the whole earth swallows up the whole band, and apparently there's like a, one piece of the earth juts out as the earth opens. Think of, you know, an earthquake, a whole slide of the, of the earth tilts down, which means that a back part tilts up, some of children, Korach's children happen to be on that part of it. So they are held up in the air like the masthead of a ship, and therefore they didn't die. And at that moment in that process, seeing that they didn't die, they did tshuva. And they respond to it by starting to sing in praise of God. In other words, what we're seeing according to this Midrash is a combination of dumb luck and repentance. What do we do with dumb luck? What do we do with the experience of we happen to have somebody who offered us kindness once? What do we do with the dumb luck of we were in a car accident and the car was spinning out of control and just happened to miss contact with another car. We ended up unscathed. In this place, in the, according to this version of the rabbinic tradition, they were part of Korach's household. By, and even though this is a metaphysical act, it's a metaphysical act that uses the laws of physics, they lucked out by being happening to be in the right place in the laws of physics when they were um, held up on the top of a piece of ground and they responded with tshuva. Rabbi, Rabbi says, every place around them was ruptured, but the very place that stood beneath them was not ruptured. Another potential way to read that is that the miracle, they had already done tshuva and the miracle showed that they were a model by not opening up underneath them where they stand. Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman said the three of them were not standing in one place. Rather, each one stood alone. The tradition here is that there were three sons of Korach. Each one stood alone, and they stood like three pillars. And that is what they said in a Breitah. On what does the world stand? On three pillars. Al Shloshad Dvarim Haolam Umeid. Some say those three pillars are Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov. Some say Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Some say the three sons of Korach. In other words, it wasn't just this dumb luck, and it wasn't just an interesting, courageous act of tshuva and breaking with a charismatic, wicked father, but this is the signature act of courageous tshuva, maybe in our entire tradition. Going back to the text that said we'd look at what we started with in Sanhedrin. A place was fortified for them in Gehinom. They sat upon it and sang songs. Rabbah Barachana said, one time I was walking my way. A certain Arab said to me, come and I'll show you the swallowed ups of Korach. I saw two cracks from which smoke emerged. He took a woolen cloth, dipped it in water, stuck it on the head of a spear, 
and inserted it, it there and it got singed, showing just how hot hell is where they are. He said to me, listen to what you hear. And I heard them saying, Moshe, Moshe v'torato emet v'hein b'dai. Moshe is true and his Torah is true and they are liars. Now there are a couple of different ways to parse that sentence. The first way, which is how Steinsaltz understands it, most of the commentaries don't say how to read it. I'm just gonna offer my own different readings. The first way is that these are the people who were with Korach's band, who did get swallowed by the earth. That in the afterlife, they have done tshuva just too late. They're saying Moshe is true, his Torah is true. And they themselves, they're testifying about themselves, were liars for previously having denied Moshe and Aharon and aligned with Korach and Zatan and Aviram. And that they're showing an ongoing act of regret for all eternity, but it was too late. And according to that reading, we see the difference between those who were swallowed up and those who did tshuva at the last minute is really the difference in fate it being so thin that at the last minute, Korach's children, maybe by chance luck, wound up on top of the ground, did tshuva, and turned everything around by singing praises to Hashem. Had they waited a moment longer, they would have been swallowed up. According to another reading, it seems like there are different traditions here. Uh, Korach's children had done tshuva earlier, and they were made an example of not being swallowed into the earth because of that. And now you really see the contrast of the regret of everybody who could have followed the children of Korach and didn't do so. The second way to read this is the Arab is saying, I heard them saying Moshe is true and his story is true, end of quote. And I'm saying about them that they are liars because they're just trying to get clemency, but they still reject Moshe and his Torah. A third possible reading is that it's all a quote of Korach and his band, Moshe is true and his Torah is true, but we're liars. And in other words, they're still hedging. You can't, you can't know when we're sincere. Are we sincere when we follow Korach? Are we sincere when we follow um, Moshe and Torah? You can't ever know. And that they're in Gehinom um, continuing to challenge the system. Now, be that as it may, um, the Talmud also tells us when we're trying to understand the authorship of the Book of Psalms to of the sons of Korach, um, the Talmud in Bava Batra tells us the order of all the writings and who wrote what parts of the, of the Tanakh. David wrote the Book of Psalms via 10 elders. It tells us David didn't write it off from his own head. He was a great poet, but didn't come up with it all. He built on, he, he edited a book based on the work of previous people, including Adam and many others, and the three sons of Korach. I want to share one other one other midrash um, from midrash to Helim that gives us insight into the rabbinic perspective on how or why or what to take from the children of Korach not dying. The beginning of Psalm 45, which is the one of the Korach psalms, the second of the Korach psalms, it begins, "For the leader on the lilies, la menasech al shoshanim." Livnei Korach Maskil Shir Yedidot. We don't really know what the word Maskil means, but it appears in a bunch of psalms. Um, so this is a song for the leader on the lilies, the children of Korach. And Midrash says, makes a connection. This is as scripture said, quoting another verse about lilies in the book of Song of Songs, Shir Shirim. My lover went down to his garden to pluck lilies. 
And my lover, according to the Midrashic reading of Song of Songs, is God. The Midrashic reading reads the entire love narrative as being between the Jewish people and God. And this is the, uh, the uh, in, in their personification, the female character is the Jewish people, the male character is God and the consistent Midrashic reading. And this is the female character saying, my lover went down to his garden. The Midrashic reading is that that's God going down to his garden to pluck lilies. Let's understand what that refers to historically. But those lilies weren't recognizable and everyone who would see them would say they're thorns. Why? because they were with thorns. It's possible that Shoshanim should be rendered as roses, not lilies. Anyway, um, because they were with thorns. And what is the way of thorns? For fire. The Midrash brings three different verses showing burning up thorns. Their thorns destroy them by fire because they're not useful, they're dangerous. And the children of Korah, who were lilies, were plucked up by God, from between the thorns so that they would not be consumed with the thorns. So the Holy Blessed One jumped and rescued them. I want to focus on this line at the beginning of the Midrash, the B'nai Korach, who were lilies. They were the people who had within them our deepest divine poetry and the powerful devotion that could merit them to be in charge of national security for the throne. But they weren't recognizable. Everyone who would see them would say, they're thorns. People look at these kids and be like, ah, their old man is a, is a bum, is a, they're a bunch of hooligans. They're gangbangers. They're hoodlums. Their parents were hoodlums. And they should not be trusted. God saw differently. God's able to make these distinctions. And God, according to this reading, if we graph this onto the other reading, maybe that having them be saved on the top of the, the earth jutting out is intentional by God, recognizing their tshuva and their non-alignment with Korach and the band. God intentionally lifts them up to show them being saved and singing songs of praise to God as a way of further demonstrating, just as God is demonstrating that the wicked are perishing, especially uh, demonstrating as a nace, as a, as a sign, as a banner, that these three people broke ranks and that they're not only gonna be spared, but they're gonna be elevated. That's what God saw when nobody else did. I'm gonna stop the share and I'd love to open it up to some comments, questions, observations. What do you make of this story? What spiritual, moral, religious lesson, lessons should we take from this tale? You can uh, click the raise hand emoji to get called on and we'll enable you to unmute yourself and share. Um, or you can share in in the comments. What do you make of this story of the sparing of Korach's children? Do you think that if you were there among the Israelites who were horrified by the uprising, do you think you would have been able to recognize Korach's children as being different from their father? What human vulnerability does this talk to? Joel says, what do you make of the story? I'll share that, but I want to open up. Like, let's, let's take our own learnings. Joel, what do you make of it? You're muted. Okay, Susan shares that there are limits to the mitzvah of honoring our parents. Susan, do you want to share a little more about that? What you think some of those limits are? How do we determine the limits? That's a very good question, but it's not an absolute that you, you're obligated to follow all the way through. I don't know where you, how you can draw the line, but you have to, that there must be a line somewhere. 
Great, thank you. Certainly the halacha, halachic texts say that if a parent explicitly instructs you to violate the Torah, then you don't follow them in doing that, which can create, you know, a lot of Bali Tshuva have had challenging dynamics around that. But, um, but yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Doug. Uh, Ellen Weinstein raised a hand. You shouldn't have to pay for the sins of your fathers. Right. Yeah, the Torah says explicitly in the book of Devarim, um, and also it's in, it's in the prophecy of Yechezkel. It seems like there was a, a reform within the, within the process of the compilation of the Torah. But yeah, the book of Devarim says explicitly that parents shall not die on account of the sins of their children, nor children on account of the sins of their fathers. It used to be originally in the earliest of biblical sources, the fact that children would die on account of their, or could be punished on account of their parents' sins, was seen as an indication of God's mercy, that in the first instantiation of the 13 attributes, God says, I don't fully visit punishment upon the sinner, but I spread it out over generations. That's a sign of God's mercy to like, to the, 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 the punishment was, had to be fully enacted, but it would be spread out so that everybody could, uh, could handle it. Then by around the time you see in Yechezkel in the book of Devarim, that is seen as unjust anymore. And Yechezkel has this prophecy, like no more, henceforth, nobody's ever going to help be held accountable for somebody else's crimes. And the book of Devarim um, writes that as law, lo yim tu avot al banim, v'lo banim al, uh, al avotam. Uh, parents shall not be put to death for the sins of their children or children for the sins of their parents. And yet, as human beings, what are our risks? I mean, think about the scene here. The, the camp was organized by geographically by tribe, by household. You have this community, Korach, this charismatic, very powerful household leader is leading this insurrection and all these people with him. Three people aren't on board with it. How would other people see those three people? I mean, we live in, I want to like make this super real. We live in a world in which one of the main predictors of being statistically in America of being caught up in the, in the penal system is having a parent who is caught in the penal system. And one of the main indica indicators of poverty is having a parent who was caught up in poverty. We very manifestly do not live in a country that recognizes uh, individual potential and individual righteousness or innocence as standing on their own. We live in a country in which the most common thing is that people, you know, people who commit crimes, whose parents are rich and powerful or are seen as upstanding citizens, get uh, clemency and leniency, even when they do really horrific things. Remember that quarterback from Stanford, um, the judge saying, this, look, this, look, this doesn't look like a bad kid to me, let him off. Whereas children of people who are castaways by society, you know, if the child is addicted to drugs, the child's in poverty, the parents in poverty, children who uh, get messed up in the law get harshness. That's the world we live in. I think that's a world that God is trying to resist, the rabbis are resisting but it's very hard. When our Midrash says that B'nai Korach were not recognizable, other people looked at them as thorns, I want us to really hear the rabbis, feel the rabbis setting up a mirror to us. Who are we as in our judgmental selves? What would we have seen? Would we have noticed that there's three righteous people right there? Or would we have said the bunch of hooligans, all of them, they should all go. Think of American discourse, you know, like around the war in Iraq, for example, and the justification of torture. I mean, Donald Rumsfeld just died a couple of days ago. We're really revisiting 
his rhetoric, the national rhetoric around who is considered a terrorist. Well, people were in the neighborhood, they were in the community of people, it's all the same. Uh, Yehudit has a hand raised, go ahead. Yehudit, wanna unmute yourself? Last maybe, chain. maybe it was accidental. Um, but there was someone else from before. Yeah. Was it Paul? Joel? Don is raising a physical hand. Why don't you go ahead, Don, and uh, speak. Um, I think in terms of um, the children of Korah, their qualities and virtues appear by their later on roles and are made visible to a community of people in terms of what uh, the beauty they, they bring to the worship. And secondly, I, I think there's a sense of fairness and equanimity of God in this whole story where God can recognize uh, the lilies among the thorns and, and bless them. Thanks, Don. What what lesson do you take for that as a person? Why, when when the Torah wants to go out of its way to tell us this happened, I mean, I imagine you know we didn't find out. You just said we only later, much later on, find out their 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 skills and their gifts. So my had they had they been punished, all would have been lost. Think of what we would have lost for the Jewish people. We would have only 140 psalms and not 150. And maybe there would have been an attack on the life of King David because there would have been a lesser security regime. And what if the people who didn't recognize them had won out? What if they had been executed by, you know, the community who saw, oh, three people from Korach's band somehow by a freak of nature escaped being swallowed into the earth. Now our, it must be that that was an accident and we, the court, have to execute them. That would have been a natural response for Moshe and Aharon. Uh, my sense is uh, uh, there's a tremendous uh, role to providence in, in this scenario. And, and that ties in with your comments about faith. Right. Thank you, Don. Yeah, other comments? Um, Julie, if there are other comments that have been shared in the chat, would you like to read them out? I, sure. I um, Jody, oops. Jody says, maybe the sons became so good because they were spared. Um, yeah, there's, I think one reading, not all of the Midrashic readings support that, but some of them imply that, um, you know, landing up on top of this jutting piece of earth was a freak. Of and that's why they started singing, and that's the moment of their tshuva. There are other voices that we saw that seemed to indicate that they had done tshuva, separated from Korach previously, and that therefore, you know, being spared, uh, being on the jutting on the top of the earth was God's way of elevating them. But yeah, the one possibility, maybe that's their moment. Maybe that's the difference between them and everybody else is that they did tshuva in time. And that that is what's really um, the lesson here is that everybody can repent. And when they do, you know, we should be very, very nervous about not paying attention. If we miss contrition, tshuva, bravery by just associating people with those around them, we're going to miss some very crucial uh, contributions. Thank you. And there's one more comment from Chris. Does the Midrash uh, give us an indication at, at which point we need to stay with heavily misbehaving family or community members and at which point we have to turn away? That's a great question. And I think it depends on the nature of stay with. So as I said in the Halakha, the Halakhic sources that address it's in the Talmud, Masachet Kiddushin, fourth chapter, addresses the mitzvah of honoring parents. 
and specifically engages the question of what if parents um, instruct you to do Torah violations? And so the halachic sources say, no, you have to violate your parents' instructions in that setting. Um, now, it gets murky when if what they're telling you to violate are rabbinic level prohibitions, but it's a biblical level mitzvah to honor them, or what if what they're telling you to do is murky or it's a matter of dispute? Um, what if they're trying to pull you into a family business and you think the family business is involved in um, dishonest dealings, but they're managing to fall just inside the line of the law, but but are you know implicitly trying to skirt the spirit of the law. There are a lot of murky situations. Um, and I think it's you know there's never going to be like a clear calculus on this. But the basic message that is told agatically through our story today and halachically through those uh, discussions around honoring your parents is that honoring our parents is a function of our bringing Torah to life in the world because continuity and tradition and inheritance going all the way back to living as people who were redeemed from slavery and are bringing liberation to the world, honoring parents is an important component of that. But when parents are acting in rejection of Torah, parents are acting as though the exodus from Egypt didn't happen and that and they're acting as though they're entitled people, entitled to hoard, we can't be with them. And this is a model, I think one of the lessons, I was asked what I take from the story, is that for the rest of us, it's very easy to draw these lines and say, like, you know, wicked people, um, wicked people, and their children are wicked people, and stay away from their whole family, um, and to condemn people based on their surroundings. I mean, in America, it's even worse because it's not just based on people's actions, but we condemn people based on their poverty. Like if somebody has been exploited and stolen from, then we blame them for it and then blame their children for it because you know, seeing their poverty is a sign of their, of their unrighteousness. Um, th those are the main indications of being caught in the criminal justice system. But I think there's a strong message here that it is really out of society's moral, spiritual, and security peril to make these security judgments especially because communities usually hide behind fears of security in order to justify treating with distrust anybody who is in the circle of somebody dangerous. And what our tradition is telling us is that it's act, our security is actually endangered by showing that undiscriminating distrust because it was the B'nai Korach who became in charge of the security detail for the throne. And maybe without B'nai Korach, maybe King David would have been assassinated at some point. The regime would have, would have fallen. So we really have to upend our, what feels like more natural ways of thinking about um, guilt by association and how to look carefully and not just see thorns, but look for lilies, where the, wherever, there's, um, wherever there's evil, there's resistance to it too. You know, I remember uh, during the Iraq-Iran war in the 80s when I was a kid, a family member of mine saying, good, let them all kill each other. Give them more weapons, let them all kill each other. Another relative of mine um, saying, you know, when there were uh, gang wars over drug, you know, drug trafficking territory, Good, let them all, give them all the dope that they want and let them all kill each other off. Well, there's a 
there's a lot of bystanders who are going to get caught up in that. When the ground opens up, how do you make sure that that the lilies aren't swallowed up with it? And that was not a concern of this family member of mine. I think it's not a concern of a lot of people um, in the discourse. I want to close with one more brief Talmudic passage, not on uh, the children of Korah explicitly, but on a related theme. The Talmud in Masechet Gitin says it was taught some of the descendants of Haman from the book of Esther learned or taught Torah in B'nai Brak. You can't tell in Hebrew whether it's Lamdu or Limdu because they're spelled the same way. So it's unclear whether it's that they learned Torah in B'nai Brak or they taught Torah in B'nai Brak. I think from context, taught makes more sense, but most, um, as far as I've seen, people who vocalize it and interpret it, read it as learned for whatever reason. Some of the descendants of Sisera taught, taught children in Jerusalem. Remember, Sisera was the general, the Philistine general whom Yael assassinated um, to save the Jewish people in her tent. But some of his descendants taught children in Jerusalem. Some of the descendants of Sancheriv, who exiled the northern kingdom, the, lost tri the 10 lost tribes, he exiled them in 722 BC. Some of his descendants taught Torah in public. And who were they? Shemaiah and Avtalion, the famous converts who were Hillel's teachers. And it's a similar story as the story of the descendants of Korach. This Gemara is not telling us that Sisera wasn't wicked or didn't deserve to be, to be assassinated by Yael. It's not telling us that Sancheriv was just or that Haman was just. These are the chief criminals in the biblical tradition. And the Talmud tells us some of their descendants taught Torah in totally integral ways. Try to imagine the rabbinic tradition. Try to imagine Judaism without Hillel. And the Gemara is telling us that Hillel could not have existed if our if our people was not able to recognize the children are not the same as their parents. Sancheriv's descendants taught Torah in public. Shema and Avtalion. Um, I will wish us a beautiful Shabbat. Yeah, thank you, Ellen, for mentioning Ruth the Moaviyah from a nation we're supposed to separate from who becomes the model of righteous embrace of Torah and ancestor of the Messiah. Um, I want to wish you a Shabbat Shalom with a reminder that it is at our own moral security and spiritual peril when we condemn people to assumptions of wickedness based on their proximity to people who have done harmful things.